read our passage and we will have a, a listen to God's word. Matthew chapter 12. At that time, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath. His disciples were hungry and they began to pluck heads of grain and to eat. But when the Pharisees saw it, they said to him, Look, your disciples are doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath. He said to them, Have you not read what David did when he was hungry and those who were with him? How he entered the house of God and ate the bread of the presence, which it was not lawful for him to eat, nor for those who were with him, but only for the priests? Or have you not read in the law how on the Sabbath the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are guiltless? I tell you, something greater than the temple is here. And if you had known what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the guiltless. For the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. Let us pray. Holy Father, we thank you for this word this morning. We pray that it would indeed speak to our hearts, that it would reach into our lives, and that through the power of your word that you would conform us to Christ, that you would renew us and sanctify us. Help us, Lord, to, to listen and to understand by your grace the word that you have for us this morning. Amen. So if you're following along in Matthew's Gospel, we're at chapter 12, and really the next section of Matthew's Gospel, chapters 12 to 16, we see Jesus withdrawing from Israel. He pulls back, I think six times we're told that Jesus withdrew from the crowds, he withdrew from certain towns and villages. And the withdrawing of Christ is often in response to confrontation, that increasingly more and more uh, religious people, good people, conservative people, people that know the scriptures are taking greater and greater offense at the very presence of Jesus in their midst. And it, again, what a stark reminder to us that it is not flesh and blood, it is not our own culture or knowledge or ability that reveals to us the truth of God. It is God's Holy Spirit, it is the grace of God to reach into people's lives. Um, these, these confrontations reveal that to us more and more, the need for God's grace, the need for the Holy Spirit to bring about change, to open the eyes of the lost. The question that we're posed with this morning is, what does a biblical Christian look like, you could say? Because that was the question that Jesus had to answer time and time again. People thought that he wasn't biblical enough. They didn't think that he held to the Torah, the, the law of God, as strictly as they expected him to do, particularly because Christ made such vast claims for himself, the power to forgive sins. He claimed to be the very son of David that the Old Testament promised. Here he speaks of himself as the very son of man that we spoke earlier of Daniel chapter 7. But when religious people looked at Christ, they didn't see in their eyes a person who took the scriptures seriously enough. Of course, they were completely misguided. The problem was not how Jesus was living. The problem was how these people had misunderstood the very core principles of Scripture. And it is a danger that we all face, not just in first century Israel, but of course that we face in our own lives. There's always the danger that we approach how to live as a Christian in an increasingly hostile world from a legalistic, judgmental perspective, ignoring the principles of Scripture, getting caught in a misguided application of Scripture, because we think that in doing so we are doing God's will. 
We're told in verse 1, at this time, Jesus was walking through Galilee, and he's walking through the grain fields. And it was Sabbath. And if you know the Gospels, any time basically it says it was Sabbath, and, and Jesus is in the, in the narrative, there's going to be a problem. Because the Shabbat, the Sabbath, was, it was just so central to Israel's identity. And it still is. Friday evening. You gather in the home. The, the Sabbath begins on Friday evening and it lasts until Saturday sunset. And it's time for prayer. It's a time to go to the synagogue. It's a time to um, celebrate the Passover, or not the Passover, but the, the Shabbat meal together. It's very important part of Israel's identity. These are the people of God and this is what we do. And let's not forget that in the days of our Lord that identity was under enormous pressure from the Roman Empire and from paganism. They had lost their political authority. They were losing their cultural identity. And so things like Sabbath were so important to God's people because they faced a world of paganism, a world that had radically hostile views concerning the true God. And so they held fast to Sabbath as a marker of who they were. And we're told that Christ's disciples were hungry and as they were walking through the grain fields, they began to um, pluck some heads of grain from the stalks and maybe rub off the kernels, have a little snack. Now, the, the Old Testament, Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 5, the law allowed people to do this. This wasn't stealing. This wasn't vandalism. In fact, there were many laws in the Old Testament concerning property rights and how the owners of grain fields had a legal responsibility to leave grain aside for poor people, for widows, for the unemployed, and even for non-citizens, for foreigners, for immigrants, and that God's people were allowed to take grain, not to harvest your neighbor's field, but to take grain if you were hungry and passing through in order to sustain you. And that was to remind Israel that the land was God's. They were merely stewards of God's land. It wasn't theirs. It was always God's land. And these laws were there to remind God's people who the land belonged to. So this isn't about stealing. This is simply about taking grain. The problem is that in taking the grain, they were probably rubbing it in their hands, taking the kernel off. And for... For Pharisees, for religiously conservative Jewish people, that simple action amounted to work. It amounted to harvesting. It amounted to violating God's solemn command that Israel was to rest on the Sabbath. We're told in verse 2, but when the Pharisees saw it, they said to him, Look, your disciples are doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath. And that gets us into the question of what law are they referring to? They are not referring to a particular verse in the Old Testament that says it is forbidden on the Sabbath to rub grain on your hands and to eat it if you're hungry. There is no verse in the Old Testament that says that. In fact, the, the reason why God gave Sabbath to Israel, and not just to the Jewish people, but to all people in Israel, to the foreigner, to the immigrant, to the non-Jewish person, the same law applied to them too, that they were given a day of rest. They couldn't be forced to work. They couldn't be told to go out into the fields and work, even if they were not Jewish. They had the right to rest. And Sabbath rest was given to Israel as a sign and a promise of God's salvation. And we will look at how Sabbath is so connected to salvation in the Old Testament. But the issue here isn't what Scripture says. It's what tradition says. It's how Scripture was interpreted by the elders and by the wise men and the, the rabbis 
And Scripture gives us, in the Old Testament, the simple principle of a holy rest for God's people. But that wasn't enough for Israel. And they began to wonder, well, how much can we get away with before we've broken the Sabbath? How, how much can we do before we're actually working? And they approached the text from a completely wrong perspective. Instead of seeing the blessing and the promise and the hope and the gift that is Sabbath, they began to approach it from a legalistic, man-centered approach. And to the simple promise of Sabbath, they added a plethora. They added hundreds of tiny different laws about what you could do, what you could hold, how many steps you could walk. Could you light a candle? Could you blow out a candle? Could you light a fire? Could you boil water? What if someone fell into a pit? Could you take them out? Could you use a rope? Could you maybe leave them there until Sunday? All these questions that were never addressed in the Old Testament because they were completely irrelevant, completely missing the point. These questions became the central focus of Sabbath. And even the rabbis themselves, in the rabbinic tradition, in the Mishnah, there's a whole section of the, of the rabbinic tradition devoted to Sabbath and the rules. And this is what one of the rabbis said. He said, the rules about Sabbath are as mountains hanging by a string. Because the scripture is few, but the rules are many. And even in that statement, you can sense some of the pressure that was on Israelites. There were so many rules, but yet scripture said so little, if anything, about these man-made rules. And it seems that people were always afraid of breaking these man-made rules. Who knew how many steps you'd taken? Who knew if you had maybe inadvertently broken Sabbath? And they had missed the purpose of it. That it was a sign of God's promise to give his people rest. And so they accused the disciples of Jesus of not doing what's lawful, breaking the Sabbath, not being holy enough. And let's have a little bit of sympathy for the Pharisees. They're always the bad guys. I think that would have been so surprising to the Pharisees. You know, if they were told in the future God's word, you know, you guys are one of the main characters in the Gospels when, in the age of Messiah. They're like, really? I knew it. We're so faithful. It's like, well, actually, it's not that good because you're usually the villain in the story. They will be shocked. They'll be like, what? We're, the, we're literally the only people who take the Bible seriously. We are people who have put our lives on the line for the preservation of the Torah and the tradition, and the culture, and the ways of God. But yes, even if that is the culture that they came from, it is so easy to fall into a spirit of legalism where we carry a spirit of judgment against every other person and we have missed the principles of Scripture. <coughs> And got caught into a legalistic framework. Don't think that that just happens to Pharisees in the first century. It happens to all of us. We need to check our hearts. And see what kind of spirit we do have towards one another. How do you find yourself using the scripture? Is it a club to beat other people over the head with? Is it a, is it a means to keep control? Or is it the living word of God? Do you let the word of God speak to you? Is the Word of God over you? Or do you stand over the Word of God? There is a danger, of course, that we wield the Bible as a club. Jesus responds to the Pharisees and he says this in verse 3. He said to them, Have you not read what David did when he was hungry and those who were with him, how he entered into the house of God and ate the bread of the presence, which it was not lawful for him to eat, nor for those who were with him, but only for the priests. 
And Mossy has taught us on this passage, 1 Samuel 21. This was when uh, David was fleeing from Saul, fleeing for his life, went to the tabernacle with a few of his trusted men, and they were about to embark on a, uh, an exile into the wilderness. They were about to run for their lives into the wilderness, and they needed food. They had no food. There was no spar. There was no centra. This was... This was not a good place to go looking for a snack. This was the tabernacle in a place called Nob. And what they did was they took the bread of the presence, the holy bread of the presence, the 12 loaves that were a symbol of Israel's presence before the menorah candle, which was the symbol of the Holy Spirit of God. They took the bread of the presence and they, they took it for their journey. And the priest gave it to them gladly. Was that against the law? Well, yeah, technically it was. There's no stipulation, there's no clause in the Old Testament that says, if you're hungry, you can take the the bread of the presence and eat it. No, it was there in the tabernacle as a symbol of Israel, and the only people permitted to eat it were the priests. David was not a priest, and his motley crew were far from priestly. But Jesus knows that the Pharisees know the Scripture, And they know that God did not condemn David for this because there was a greater need than the symbol of 12 loaves reminding Israel of their presence before God. There was a need. It was life and death. It was these men need food. They're running for their lives. That takes precedent. Show me the verse. There is no verse. There's a higher principle. Life. That's what Jesus is challenging the Pharisees. There's a principle here you're not getting. You're caught in the minutiae. You're caught in the details. You're caught in the tradition. You're caught in all this extra biblical layers that you've put on top of the Bible. And that's how you're reading it. And that's why you're so angry. That's why you're so judgmental. Because you've missed the voice of God. And you're using scripture simply as a weapon to beat people over the head with. There's a higher principle Jesus goes on. Or have you not read in the law how on Sabbath the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are guiltless? This was well accepted rabbinic tradition. The law said you should do no work, no no servile work on the Sabbath. In other words, you're not doing your job on the Sabbath, you need to rest. It doesn't mean you shouldn't help someone if they're in need. No servile work. No work for profit. No work for wages. You are to rest. But the priests didn't rest on the Sabbath. If anything, the priests were more busy on Sabbath than they were for the rest of the week. Every Sabbath, two lambs were offered at the temple. And the tabernacle. And people came to worship. And so the priests were profaning the Sabbath every week. Because they worked harder on Sabbath than anyone else. But this was understood that again there was a higher principle at work because they were serving God. They weren't serving themselves, they were serving God and ministering to God's people. Again, there was a higher principle at work here. Jesus goes on to say in verse Six, He says, I tell you that something greater than the temple is here. And that's an interesting statement. We shouldn't run past that. What is Jesus saying here? He's, he's, he's alluded to the temple and tabernacle. Twice He's given both examples that deal with the, the worship of Israel, the, the, the liturgical and worship center of Israel, which was the tabernacle in the days of uh, the judges and David, and then the, the temple proper in the days of Solomon. Both of the examples of Sabbath, Jesus draws from those and shows us a higher principle at work, a principle that it is better to do good than evil, that it is better, better to serve the needs of people than to be caught into a legalistic 
judgmental framework. But then Jesus says, there's something bigger than the temple here. In this grain field, in this field up in Galilee, there's something greater than the temple. But you don't, you don't see that, do you? You don't even recognize who you're speaking with. You're so concerned about preserving and applying God's, God's word that you don't even recognize that you're speaking to the word. You're speaking to the Logos, the word made flesh. They knew their Bible, and we should commend them for that. They probably knew it better than any of their contemporaries. They knew what it said, but they had missed what it meant. They had failed to see the hand of God, and instead began to use Scripture as a way to promote their own tradition their own self-importance, their own religiosity, their own self-righteousness. And in doing so, they are spiritually blind to the truth and to the ways of God. And yet, even as they're harassing Jesus with these questions, he says, you know, he gives them two examples from the, from the Old Testament, and then he just reminds them, you know, in the days of David, he went to the tabernacle, he took the bread of presence. There was a higher principle at work there. It's better to help. The priests, every Sabbath, they work harder than they ever do during the week. They profane the Sabbath, but they don't because there's a higher principle at work. They're serving others. But there's also something greater than the temple. If you notice, Jesus is speaking in the present tense. Something greater than the temple is here, he says to them. And that should have caused, you know, a little bit of questioning. What kind of a statement is that? Something greater than Jerusalem is here in this field? Galilee, looking around, a farmyard? Something greater than the house of God, the Beth Yahweh? Something greater than the temple is here in this field? Yes, there is. There is the Son of God. There is the Word made flesh. And there is a critical lesson in that field that Jesus again reminds the Pharisees of. And this is the second time that Jesus returns to the prophet Hosea. Verse 7. If you had known what this means... I desire mercy and not sacrifice. You would not have condemned the guiltless. It's the second time in Matthew's Gospel, Jesus quotes Hosea 6.6. 6. And in both cases, he's, he's you know, reminding the Pharisees, you know, have you not read? Well, of course they've read. They've memorized it. The point is, have you understood? Have you let God's word take a hold of your life? Or is it just information you're packing into your brain? God said to Israel, I desire mercy and not sacrifice. Something greater than the temple. Something greater than going to the temple. It's showing mercy. Chesed. What a wonderful word. Mercy. Grace. Love. Loyalty. Faithfulness. Commitment. If you look at your English Bible, there's just this range of English words that we pack into that three-letter word in Hebrew, chesed. It, it's, so, it's so rich. It speaks of giving to the one who doesn't deserve it, showing them favor, showing them mercy, showing them love, compassion, generosity. Naomi said to Ruth, Boaz, he is a man of chesed. I've seen how he treats you. He doesn't even follow the law. He's given you more than the law requires. That's chesed. He gives you mercy. He gives you blessing. He gives you love. That's what God wants from his people because that reveals who God is. God is the God of chesed. 
the God of compassion. Scripture should never be used as an ugly weapon to fight amongst ourselves. But we should submit our lives to the holiness of God's word and see the central principles of Scripture. Which is that mercy is more important than sacrifice. You know, there was something more important than keeping the law of the bread of the show table. There's nothing wrong with the the law that stipulated those 12 loaves that had to be laid out every day in the tabernacle and later the temple before the great menorah candle. It was a beautiful reminder that here were God's people in his presence. And that candle was a reminder of the Holy Spirit of God in their midst. But there was something even more important than that. It was giving that bread away to people that were hungry. To a legalist, the most important thing is just keeping the rules as you got them. Nothing else gets in the way. There's no verse that says give the bread to the hungry. It's just, you can't show me that verse. It says what it says. It says what it says, but there are also principles of Scripture. Hosea 6.6, 6, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. That is what Christ is challenging them, to understand the spirit rather than the letter, to understand the meaning, the intent, the purpose of God, and to check their own hearts. Why is it that they're following Jesus in this field in the first place? Have you ever wondered that? Is it because they, they just love hanging out with fishermen? Is it because they think Jesus is fantastic? By chapter 12, they've already planned to murder him. They're there because they want to fight. They want to argue. They want to belittle Jesus. They want to show how much they know about the Bible, how little he knows about the Bible. And his band of merry men are just reprobate, false teachers. That's all they're doing in the field. Something greater than the temple was in that field, but they couldn't see it. It's a challenge to us. To have a love for scripture because it is the very voice of God. But to submit our lives to scripture. With a humility. To check ourselves. Are we becoming legalistic? Or are we actually living according to the principle of scripture? Mercy is at the center of God's will. And that's why Christ reminds them once more. Of Hosea 6.6, 6, I desire mercy and not sacrifice. And then Jesus concludes, he says, The Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. Now, if they had a problem with the disciples of Jesus, you know, doing rubbing grain in their hand and eating it, you can't imagine how angry they were when they heard this. The Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. What a claim. Something greater than the temple is here. Jesus is Lord of the Sabbath. Because only Jesus can give us the rest that Sabbath points to. Jesus is Lord of the Sabbath. Because Sabbath actually pointed to what he was going to do. Sabbath points ahead to the grace of God. Sabbath points ahead to the rest that God's people find in the finished work that is done for them. He is Lord of the Sabbath because only he can give rest. The New Testament, it warns Christians against the legalism even now in the church to do with holy days and Sabbaths and feast days. It warns us in Colossians chapter 2 verses 16 to 17. Paul has to give a reminder to the church not to fall into this way of approaching the work of God through a lens of ungratefulness and legalism. Paul says, therefore, let no one pass judgment on you 
in questions of food and drink or in regard to a festival or a new moon or Sabbath. These are a shadow of the things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. These are not things the church should be fighting over or judging each other over. What day you worship, what kind of food you eat. But these were the questions in our Lord's day that that's pretty much all they thought about. That's the spirit of legalism. Paul reminds the church that actually these were a shadow. These were a foreshadowing. These were a picture. But the substance, the reality, the fulfillment of even Sabbath and all of the feast days, Day of Atonement, Day of Tabernacles, Passover, they all point to Christ. He is the fulfillment. He is the substance. He is the meaning behind what these things foreshadowed. For the church today, we are told that we must enter into that Sabbath, that spiritual Sabbath, that rest that only Christ brings us. In Hebrews, we are told, So then there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works as God did from his That is a beautiful application of the meaning of Sabbath for the Christian. It isn't a day. Sabbath isn't a period of time. For the Christian, Sabbath is the promise that we can rest in what God has done for us. That is what Calvary is all about. When Christ said, it is finished, the church enters into the rest of God. It's a time of thanksgiving. It's a time to say, Lord, you have done the work. You have established the rest for my soul. And so I rest in you and your perfect will and your perfect work for me. What was Israel supposed to be reminded of during Sabbath? Ezekiel tells us. Ezekiel chapter 20 verse 12 is a beautiful verse. This is Yahweh speaking. Moreover, I gave them my Sabbaths as a sign between me and them that they might know that I am the Lord, that I am Yahweh, who sanctifies them. Isn't that beautiful? The Old Testament prophets, they said, The sign of Sabbath was to remind Israel that spiritually there is no work that they can do. There is no work that can be done. There is no work that God requires. Because it is God who sanctifies His people. It is God's work in the life of God's people that produces change and life and rebirth. And God gave them Sabbath that they would recognize that they rest in the work of God for them. It is God who sanctifies Israel and they rest in the work of God for them. This is exactly what Hebrews tells the church, that we enter into that rest that Christ has purchased for us. I'll finish with this. There was a book written a long time ago, about 1,600 years ago. So, even before Mossy was born. And this is a book written in North Africa by a wonderful theologian. And he reflected on the, the verse that we just read in Ezekiel. That Sabbath was a sign that God has done work for Israel and that Israel rests in that. And this is what he said. He was pondering good works Obedience in the Christian life, so important. But how does that relate to Sabbath? And he said this, he said, Even our good works that we do as Christians, when they are understood rather to be God's work than ours, and that God's work is imputed to us, that we may enjoy this Sabbath rest. For if we attribute Good works to ourselves, they become servile works. They become works done for a wage. 
But the scripture says you shall do no servile work on Sabbath. Therefore, it is also said by Ezekiel the prophet, I gave them my Sabbaths to be a sign between me and them, that they might know that I am the Lord who sanctifies them. This knowledge of what God has done will be perfected when we shall be perfectly at rest. And we shall perfectly know that He is God. And in God's presence there we shall rest and see and see and love and love and praise. And this will be in the end, without end, to God's glory. We've learned a lot this morning. We've learned about the true way to look at Scripture, to avoid a spirit of legalism, to recognize that there are principles in Scripture that take precedent, that sometimes it is okay to go beyond what the law has stated for the higher principle of life and serving others. And we are also taught this morning that the true meaning of Sabbath is rest. It is the rest that only God can provide for our lives. It is trusting in Him for our salvation. That is the beauty of God's work for us. That is why on Yom Kippur, the holiest day of Israel, when the sacrifices of atonement was brought in, God laid down everything that the priests were supposed to do for the nation and it was a reminder that God provides atonement for his people and the stipulation laid down on God's people on that very holiest day was you rest. You don't even have to come to the temple. Stay at home. Rest. It's my work for you. Praise God. Lord, we thank you that you have done it all. We thank you for your grace. Give us that spirit of grace to each other, Lord. Give us that sense of your holiness and that our life would be marked by a a compassion, a generosity, truthfulness, Lord. We thank you that you desire mercy, not sacrifice. We thank you that you have done the work that we will enter into your rest. We praise you in Christ's name.